Hi, I'm Tori Mondelli and I work at Mercy College as the Executive Director for the Office for Teaching Excellence and Engaged Learning. I'm here with two of my colleagues uh, to discuss game-based learning. Howdy, I'm Joe Biz. I'm a professor at the City University of New York, Borough Manhattan Community College, professor in the English department, and I also do a lot of work in game-based learning. I'm Rob Duncan. I am an Associate Professor of Behavioral Sciences at York College and the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. And I study uh, the intersection between undergraduate research and game space learning. So Joe and I are in the process of writing a book. It's called The Allure of Play, The Educator's Guide to Game-Based Learning. And as part of our research, uh, we really wanted to have this conversation with you today, Rob, okay. um, because you're doing such interesting work, such innovative work uh, with regard to co-design, designing learning games uh, with your students. So. We've kind of put together some uh, ideas that we, that we can chat about, and uh, looking forward to this. Looking forward to it. Do you remember a time when you actually didn't use games to facilitate learning, and what was your former pedagogy? What did it look like? How, uh, did, how did you come to GBL? Um, well, so I have an unusual background. I started when I was a graduate student. I did the classic thing where you are a teaching assistant, um, and I did very little there. I made some exams, I maybe lectured once, so I got very little teacher training. Back then, those days, they didn't really teach they all, they all people didn't. how to teach. So um, I guess it depends on the school and the discipline. And then um, I ended up at the Salk Institute where I was doing a lot of research where there was no teaching. I was one of the few graduate students there. Um, my main uh, appointment was actually at the University of California, San Diego, but my lab was with Dr. Thomas Albright in the Salk Institute. And apart from TNA, TAN, I really didn't teach at all. And that I stayed at the Salk Institute for several years, actually, and actually got a medical school appointment there. So I had years and years and years of no experience teaching. And then suddenly, when I was on the job, the tenure track um, job market, I realized I had to ramp up a teaching. So I took a bunch of online classes in, and I started teaching at community colleges. And it was a little rough. I taught with the standard lecture model that everybody was uh, familiar with. I used PowerPoint slides. I tried to tell stories using vi visual images, um, so no text on the slide. But there was no interactivity. There was no active learning whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And games, the, the notion of putting a game in my classroom is very far removed. Um, I would say the first time that I got into the notion that the classroom could be very game-like and very playful was when in 2008 I went to the Game Developers Conference to follow a friend of mine and all this happened at the same time. I was on the job market, I was actually considering doing a professional music and becoming a composer and I followed a great friend of mine to GDC and I met these wonderful people as a great intersection of artists, engineers and thinkers and designers and I thought, well, gosh, you know, if, all, if there's so much engagement in this space, why is my classroom so boring? You know, what can I do to make my classroom a more engaging and interactive space? And that's really where the seed was planted. Wow. wow. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the, the short answer is, and I, this will unfold later, but then I eventually got the tenure track job, did not become a professional musician. And, uh, <laughs> none of it, none of it. Yes, it's always yeah, out there. Yeah, you could always yeah. do that. Oh, yeah, we do both. So... Knowing you, I, I have a, a, a suspicion that when you work with learning games in the classroom, when you partner with students to design games, most likely it's grounded in theory. Can you t tell us a little bit about that? You know, how are these learning games uh, that you design with students uh, grounded in theory? Yeah, there's there's many um, there are many approaches to infusing classroom uh, games in your classroom, and a lot of people come to it very intuitively, which is not a bad thing. Um, but I'm in psychology, so the notion of kind of doing experimentation and grounded in theory is very important, and particularly when it comes to learning. We need to be able to measure learning outcomes, identify learning outcomes, measure them, and use that to kind of feed into how we teach. Otherwise, it can be uh, a big series of trial and error. and. I actually didn't start using theory or guiding my decisions until I started writing uh, applications for NSF proposals. Okay. And in the cyber learning grant mechanism, I, real, I realized that there was a huge literature of teaching that for a long time had been independent of the psychology of learning and the neuroscience of learning. And these three disciplines, 
and addition more, including uh, other disciplines as well, were starting to weave together in what we now call the learning sciences. Yes. And um, when I applied for the cyber learning grant mechanism, I s saw that there was an, an abundance of great resources that pointed to the theory and the learning sciences. A lot of it was education theory that I was unfamiliar with. A lot of it was um, theories that I believe ran in parallel to what we knew in psychology and a lot of neuroscience was very much kind of still in the shadow, although it informed psychology. Uh, so knowing more about the neuroscience aspect of learning and memory, I started to say, well, what do we know about learning in, um, in this discipline and how does it transfer into classrooms? And one, one other note on that was, I believe in around 2007 at the Salk Institute, they had a summit on learning and memory hosted by Terry Sanowski. Um, I believe he was the main host and they wrote a white paper and they summarized learning uh, what was known in the field from the biological perspective and the machine learning perspective. Because Terry Sanowski is a computational biologist, he's very much interested in how computers could be used to form models of learning and memory. And I saw that white paper. I did a search when I was, you know, 2008 when I was excited about all this stuff. And I think um, Metzger, forgive me if I forget the name, also published something in Science around that time identifying a new change in learning. Okay. So right around 2008, there are neuroscientists and psychologists uh, all getting interested in this. And so I started reading a lot about theory, and um, that eventually uh, became uh, part of the stuff I also combined with the cyber learning uh, resources to form my own knowledge of my own theories about how education should be working. Terrific. Um, how do you work in the um, the design of how you'll measure your learning outcomes in the games that you make with students? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll give a little preface before I started making games. In classrooms with students, I was taking students in my lab to design games, and I took about 50 uh, students over the years as independent study students, and we would just sit like you would design like a game designer would, or a psychologist would, would design it in intervention. And eventually I realized, in accordance with the undergraduate research movement, that the best thing is to infuse these skills into classrooms. So I developed two courses. One is the foundations of game design, uh, game-based game learning, and the other is techniques of digital game-based learning. One is all computer stuff and one is all design. And in the design course, uh, every Every student is working on a long-term project, and it's all student-driven. And that's where we get to the answer to your question. The student right. sort of identifies what they're interested in. I try and align it with their career goals and interests. Mm. And then when we identify what it is that the, the intervention they think they want to design, then we start to identify learning outcomes. And then from the psychologist's perspective, we create operational definitions for those learning outcomes and decide, look at how professionals measure it, how, the, how it's measured mm -hmm. traditionally in the literature, and then I try and get my student game designers to measure it in game using the same techniques. Okay. So the most elegant thing we could possibly do is to incorporate an already standardized metric mm -hmm. into our game and then use that to drive engagement on the front end so that that metric becomes the feedback that the player gets when they're playing the game and then they can adjust. I mean, you can adjust the difficulty level based on performance and so okay. on and so forth. Terrific. So if I'm understanding you correctly, then there seems to be two sets of learning outcomes. So you you have the learning, the desired learning outcomes of the game that's being yeah. created, but then presumably you have learning outcomes for your students yes. in that yeah. course. Yeah. So you're doing, yeah. you know, yeah. there's kind of a multi-layered uh, situation Yes, there. and I, I, I'm not <laughs> sure which one you were addressing, but yeah. that's, uh, you, that's totally you fine. You yeah. seem to describe the one, the learning outcomes for the games. That's yes. being designed, yeah. and I think that that's really what we care mostly about yeah. Uh, yeah. right now. But it's also interesting sure. to think that then you have another process as an educator uh, e to assess those students. Yeah, and and so what I use um, to identify the classroom learning outcomes, the things I would put in my syllabus, uh, is I've distilled a lot of well, a lot of information from various things, and of course they, you know, every act. Every instructor knows you want to kind of work backwards from right. the skills that you want to go mm -hmm. uh, train in. What we were seeing in our department was that students, um, 
even if they mastered content knowledge, they were lacking in process knowledge. And this is the story that is unfolding around the country. A lot of people are uh, reporting the same thing. And in my department in particular, we would have a research methods course and maybe a few courses where papers were required, but there wasn't a lot of emphasis on design and iterative design. And so after you know, uh, consulting the literature and the resources from the cyber learning grant mechanism, I learned a lot about design-based research. And so those were the types, the types of learning outcomes that would be identified in that grant mechanism were the things that I put in my course, the ability to iterate, um, the ability to design and grow a program slowly, um, be able to compute advanced statistics along the fly, uh, uh, read the primary literature, uh, and use that to inform the design of their intervention. Uh, it, it goes on and it goes on, but it's similar to anything that you would design in a project, but it's now just combined with game. I really design. like what you landed on because not only are you satisfying sort of, you know, academic learning outcomes, but these outcomes sound like things that students will use in the real workplace. These are things employers are looking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I try, oddly enough, one of the challenges is, uh, in, in doing this is that you get students who come to the class because they see the word game in the title. Mm -hmm. And even though you tell them at the outset, sometimes it's difficult to actually convince them that these are worthy skills. I mean, you mm -hmm. can tell them, I say, look, we're not just designing games, we're designing for human experience. And this mm -hmm. translates to anything you do, particularly psychology um, majors, because no matter what discipline they're going to be in, they're probably going to be participating in some kind of intervention if they end up in they could be in human resources, they could be clinical uh, psychologists, uh, they could be researchers, but they're always going to be designing in some capacity for human experience. Makes sense. So yeah. they, do, they do walk away from it, but so I think, you know, when you put a bunch of work on students and you give them a tremendous amount of independence, there's always this kind of onerous panic, this onerous amount of work they perceive, and they get a little panicky sometimes, and then they settle in and then get the group. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. Makes sense. So obviously, a lots of teachers, not every teacher who's using game-based learning is actually having their students making games in the classroom. Yeah. Um, so you spoke to the value that the students are getting from playing these games. Shortly put, what do the students actually gain from the act of designing mm -hmm. the games? Um, boy, there's, there's actually so many things that they get. One is... Um, they get the skill of pure design starting from scratch, which is a very, very difficult thing. A lot of papers are assigned to students. A lot of constraints are usually given to students when they're designing a project. But the notion of starting from nothing, uh, except for their own real desire of what they want to do in life, and then building an intervention around that is, is really kind of challenging. Um, if I understand the question <laughs> in its entirety, because there's so many things that I could attach to that. Uh, ask me again. I'm sure. li 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 I was thinking about yeah. what did the students gain from the very act of designing games? Yeah. And of course, part of that question would be um, when you're also having them design the content yeah, for okay. the class. So uh, in designing the intervention, there is this kind of resilience and learning from failure that people call it grit, people call it mm -hmm. a number of names. Um, but they need to learn by doing, and they need the training wheels taken off. And that's the, that kind of persistence that, that they would design a project for an entire semester and the entire class is based only on that yeah, is, is something that they learn. Now, along with that comes all these skills, accessing the primary literature, um, being able to read uh, articles that are above their head and uh, distill it to its necessary components so they can inform their design. Two practical skills like learning Photoshop. Uh, I teach statistics in Excel. I'll have, I'll have little one-hour workshops where I teach them a skill that they can or might want to use or it might be required to use to complete their design. So we learn Perfect. WordPress in sounds one hour. Like, just sounds in like just time in time, right? Yeah, yeah, very much just in time learning. All the, oh, there's so much in, in the class. Mm -hmm. And as an instructor, I improvise a lot because I have to look at the classroom and be able to see what is working and what is not working, what do they need, what do they don't need. And if I find they're struggling with statistics, mm -hmm. I will do a one-hour session on this is how you do a t-test in Excel mm -hmm. and create a graph. Mm -hmm. 
This is how you use WordPress once I've created an account for you. Um, this is how you make a poster. Uh, I send them to the Game Crafter, and I, because part of what we do is we're teaching, you know, from uh, all the skills that, you, that would be necessary to complete a project or an intervention in psychology, and the other comes from uh, the private sector, where it's how to design games and how to use the market resources that exist there to design a better product. And students have never been shown how to do that. They've never been shown how to, to right. use a website in my, or design a website in my class to show or present their work. Um, so 20th, after the design and, and all these skills of art creation and asset creation or paper design, um, then eventually comes the dissemination and that's where WordPress comes in. How do they create an e-portfolio? Uh, how do they show off their games? Um, mm -hmm. If they want to publish it, could they use the game, game crafter to actually publish their comp completed project? Maybe sell it. That's great. So you have the real world context of what it means to professionalize yourself and a product, develop it from execution. It's like a managers in training. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. So let's see, if you started teaching in what, 2008, 2009? Uh, yeah, right at, at, okay. at this position. Okay, so yeah. you're almost 10 years in, in, yeah, into this work. Nine on the nose. Nine -ish. Okay, yeah. nine on the nose. So let me ask you, you know, in, in this work, what has surprised you the most? Well, that is a really, really good question. Uh, there are good surprises and there are unpleasant surprises. Right. And I think um, the, good, the good surprises are always when a student um, gets extremely passionate about their work mm -hmm. and when they carry something really far on their own and they end up teaching you about something you didn't know. I've had students design wonderful games. Um, when you have 30 students in the classroom, you try to keep up with every project, but sometimes the project will take off on its own and you might not have touched base with that student in a while and you come back and then they're doing this exciting card game that's a mix of Clue, but they're studying microaggressions or uh, they come and they come up with crazy ideas that I think would make amazing professionally marketed games. They might not have skills to bring it to market yet. Uh, but those are the, the happiest surprises. And of course, when you get a student who, who um, persists and they have uh, followed you around academically, you know, maybe taken a couple courses from you, maybe did independent study, and then they get into a PhD program. Whether or not it's, it has to do with game design or otherwise, um, having students get into like high levels of academia and get accepted to programs based on the type of work that they've done um, is, is really great. May I ask just yeah. a question of clarification? So. Um, the students you work with are mostly undergraduate, or oh, yeah. do you have master's degree level students? I've, I've had master's students, and uh, they actually went on to do uh, this game, a study of game-based learning. Uh, one at Jam Ultram came to me via Brooklyn College, and mm -hmm. she went to University of Florida, where she is studying game-based learning uh, in a psychology department. So okay, this is, fantastic. I mean, a new developing field that you will see more and more. It might be masked in other things like digital learning or media, mm -hmm. maybe in blend with other departments. Okay. Um, but the vast majority yeah. of your students are undergraduates? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, overwhelming. And those pleasant surprises are, happen with them yeah. also. Yeah. You're seeing it at all levels. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah overwhelming. And oh, this, when I was referring to students getting into programs, I was actually referring to undergraduates, okay, not, not master's students. Um, ideally, I'm trying to develop a pipeline from high school to grad school um, within the psychology uh, vein first, but hopefully to be inclusive of other disciplines. My dream is to have lots of students from various disciplines working together on a single project, including computer science students, media students, psychology for design, business for marketing, have them all work together, maybe doing uh, game jams in high school over the summer with us that carries maybe through their discipline, and then hopefully some of those will go on to create what I think is going to be a new field of uh, game-based learning in graduate schools. Terrific. The yeah. idea sounds like a great NSF proposal. Another <laughs> one for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. So bringing it out of the uh, physical classroom for a moment, um, why might a teacher want to entertain bringing games or game mechanics into the online classroom and what might that look like? Um, yeah. it's. Um, so if I go back to one of the motivations for in, in including game-based learning in the classroom, I'd have to say it's to encourage interactivity, which is a more natural form of learning. 
uh, from infants on forward, we learn more by manipulating our environment, getting feedback and learning mm -hmm. from that experience, whether we're successful or not successful. And uh, in the on one of the greatest things about the online learning environment is that it places the onus of learning on the student, on the learner. And while the instructor might be less available and some students um, need reassurance, they need a little hand-holding, a lot of them actually, I, you know, I have students in, in two classes, the face-to-face the -face and online learning, and what I find is the same student who might be codependent on me in the face-to-face -face environment actually does quite well in the online environment. They take off on their own because really? they need to be responsible for their learning. They acknowledge that and they become more driven. Now, in that in that world, one of the problems is there's a very slow feedback loop. It depends on how quick the instructor is able to give the student um, feedback on their project. So in that way, it's also difficult to infuse those courses with game-based learning because the feedback mechanism might be very, very slow. Um, so one way in when I consider online learning in general to cut back on that feedback is have the students be the arbiters of taste in their own learning journey. And that means instead of just giving them an assignment and then they submit it and then you give them a rubric and give them feedback, what I tend to do is I say, I will not give you approval of your thesis. You need to be, you need to understand when your thesis is ready. So they give them a very elaborate worksheet that has a checklist of what makes a solid thesis. Does it include the independent variable, the dependent variable? Does it discuss how you're measuring the dependent variable? Does it make a prediction? Does it refer to the theory? And when they go through that, I, I'm not saying this is a game in any way, but when right. they go through that, they now have a quicker feedback mechanism to inform their learning where the instructor isn't involved at all. Mm -hmm. so that's the mechanic, okay. Yeah, so it's kind of like a non-digital form of, mm -hmm. of, of immediate feedback. Um, that's probably the worst worst phrasing I could possibly do for that. <laughs> it's uh, very edit, understandable, edit. though. It's an um, NDMA. <laughs> so, so how? So I here's what I d I don't at this moment put a lot of game based learning in my online courses. But this is something that I'm inspiring to d aspiring to do using this type of mechanism, either a com combination of peer learning, mm -hmm. where they can get feedback through peers in a game like fashion or some type of game-based learning where the instructor doesn't need to provide immediate feedback. So that could be in the form of scaffolded puzzles, yes, uh, mysteries, yeah. and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, again, for me, this is the future. Uh, the two risks I would see is that when you do create something like a puzzle or something with a discrete answer, the challenge is the same as any type of game-based learning. There's a single correct answer, and that's very hard for a learner who doesn't get the puzzle mechanic. They might fail early and get frustrated. Um, so I'm still having to work some of these things out. Okay. Yeah. I realize we may want to circle back uh, to the question I asked earlier about surprises, because you alluded yeah. to the pleasant, happy surprises, yeah. but that also there may be some unpleasant ones. So do you want to share uh, perhaps something, you know, that that surprised you in that, yeah, in that yeah. more negative way? Yeah, well, um, and you know, these are, of course, we say negative and unpleasant, but really these are the experiences that we need to, to, to talk about because if we don't talk about them, the, we as instructors in the field can't learn and the students don't benefit, etc. So some of the unpleasant things I found are that um, students are very much addicted to grades. Mm -hmm. and. Um, there is a cognitive component to this and a behavioral component to that. And the cognitive component, I've tried my best to tell them that the, the process of learning is the most important. Um, I've even given assignments that were ungraded but beneficial. So they, for example, I was talking about WordPress. I had an optional module this semester because we were running out of time where they could post their game in WordPress to learn about WordPress. Merely for the mm -hmm. act of learning, it would be uh, one class session and I told them this is ungraded, but this is a huge benefit to your learning because now you'll be able to go out in the world and create a website. And immediately they didn't care. Mm -hmm. This, they're, you're, you're, yeah. So you're giving them a huge freebie, where you're saying, look, this is really valuable, and they, they obviously they use ninety some percent of students are on smartphones, uh, using the internet, and in our uh, student population and. So they know the value of this skill. 
but because it wasn't graded, it was a problem. So they get addicted to the grades, and it's very difficult to sometimes move them away from that in one class meeting, in particular when you're doing a project-based um, class, because there's so many skills that tie into this that they have to learn on their own, or the just-in-time learning. It might come from the instructor, but it also might come from the student, where they realize, mm -hmm. oh gosh, I need to learn how to you know, create some audio for my game, or I need to mm -hmm. find some paper resources or learn how to use an art program so I can make my cards look really good. And if there's no points in that, then it might not happen. Uh, so what I've done over the years is to try and, while well, this might reinforce and make the problem worse, I try and take the larger pro project and I break it down to as many subcomponents as possible, itemize everything throughout the semester. Um, so for example, my thesis uh, worksheet is a page long with maybe 20 different questions on it that they can ask themselves to, mm -hmm. to, to complete this project, but there's points associated with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, part of the problem. Well, yeah, I understand why you're doing that. I mean, it's uh, short of, um, you know, dismantling the whole assessment yeah. structure at your university. Yeah, yeah. You know, how, how also you're, you know, you're finding a solution within the, you know, the yeah. current environment. And it sounds like for the most part it's, it's working. Um, I think, you know, also when we think about our students um, being offered such a great opportunity like to learn WordPress, mm -hmm. the reasons why they may not do it are certainly multifaceted. You know, they, they have those other classes that they're still yeah, working sure. on. You know, if they yeah. had more time, they probably would take you up on that. That's, yeah, yeah. In that's one class, offer. in one class, yeah, we always have to remember we're not the only class we're teaching, but there's also mm -hmm. a history since they have this long, mm -hmm. Uh, eight year plus history of doing things a particular way and being concerned about particular secondary reinforcers and mm -hmm. just like we don't want to put a secondary reinforcer in a game because it trivializes the learning the core game mechanic um, that exists in the classroom you know points for a secondary reinforcer in life, mm -hmm. so. in life. Mm -hmm. yeah well that's a really good question you bring up is you know, there's so many secondary reinforcers that are motivators for us in everything we do. Is it a bad thing to include them? Maybe it's something that needs to be learned. Maybe we as designers need to learn how to dovetail those two uh, yeah. in our instruction. So, speaking of programs, over the years, of course, you led or participated in many faculty development experiences, mm -hmm. and we're wondering, what are just a few critical concepts that you would love to inform teachers watching who are interested in pursuing game-based learning? Um, from, from, the, uh, from faculty development, um, I think probably the most valuable resource I was given when I started teaching at your college was Ken Bain's book. Um, I'm forgetting the title, but it's what how... The best college what the best teachers college teachers do. Yeah. yeah, I love that book. Yeah, and really what it was for me was a confirmation of the ideas mm -hmm. that um, that I had been banding around, banding about in 2008. Of course, I'm still a latecomer to this field as well, so um, a lot of people already have these ideas. But I think that was the most valuable thing because it showed me that instructors from a variety of disciplines were doing a lot of active learning mm -hmm. in the classroom, in biology and chemistry and so on and so forth, and that... Um, it really just uh, allowed me to have the freedom to experiment in my own classroom. Great. And do you know that the second book you wrote, What the Best College Students Do? Oh, I... That came a yeah, few years later. Yeah, it was yeah. also award-winning. And um, yeah. I think it's really interesting, too, because we can look at those gleanings and try to structure right. it in the classroom. Yeah, it is alarming. Uh, Maura Smale just published a book with her co-author, whose name I'm forgetting at the moment, uh, where she did a broad survey of CUNY students, and I was alarmed to find some of the things that our students were faced with, including some outlier commutes of maybe almost two hours um, wow. on a bus to get to, to certain campuses. Right. Yeah, and um, the details really are because our system, I, it, to my knowledge, you apply to the entire CUNY system and if you live in the Bronx and you get in only at your college, mm. then you have now suddenly a two-hour commute. Uh, or if you have to work far away from your campus. And so those challenges might integrate with what good students do or don't do um, to improve their learning and we need to, as designers, now start to incorporate this. That's another reason why I do a lot of online.
um, teaching is because I think that there's a huge portion of students who could benefit from being able to learn at home mm -hmm. as, in addition to face-to-face. -to -face. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And what about a, a book or essay that would introduce uh, specifically game-based learning ideas? Uh, my a seminal book. Yeah. Um, my favorite books that I always refer to are very popular. They're Tracy Fullerton's Game Design Workshop which I think is great not only because it shows you the vocabulary of games, but it also walks instructors through uh, a d design process um, from start to finish. So it has a very nice narrative that unfolds for somebody who's just getting into it. And then I immediately, of course, recommend Jesse Shell's The Art of Game Design, A Book of Lenses, because after you've learned the linear narrative, he goes back and he looks at games through various uh, lenses, various vantage points on what makes games work. Um, and I think those are great f for instructors to learn about game design. Um, I think some of the books that spoke about pedagogy that influenced me the most were uh, James G's books, Jim G's books, and um, David Williamson Schaefer's text, which I'm also forgetting the name of. And those were early on in addition to, um, I came to Katie Salen and, and, and Eric Zimmerman's book rather late, but uh, for me, personally, the first two that I found that I recommend were Jim G's and uh, David Williams and Jay. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, great. So I think we can refer to the worst learning games uh, made, you know, as a kind of chocolate-covered broccoli. Yeah. You know, yeah. How, how do you work with your students to guard against that danger? Yeah, well... Sometimes showing them a bad example is, is the best way to get the idea across. Um, it's For psychologists and psychology students, it's usually a little more intuitive than most because we have the concept of primary and secondary reinforcers in, in our, in our uh, world. And so if a student has had behavioral psychology, they do understand that secondary reinforcers can devalue primary reinforcers. So I usually teach it from that perspective and students understand it from that perspective. Mm -hmm. How do I get the point across viscerally? Mm -hmm. um, I usually show um, when the game, when my foundations of game-based learning class is starting, we play a bunch of games in the first uh, three weeks and they critically analyze games using a rubric I developed from Tracy Fullerton's book. So I oh, nice. took her principles and kind of created this kind of checklist for students to learn about the vocabulary of games and so on and so forth. So in that I talk about learning mechanics and we talk about primary and secondary reinforcers. Um, the games we play uh, what is the one that I use? I'm forgetting one that I use to show bad. It's one of the math games, not Math Blasters. It, it's called, so I go back to one of the classic old learning games, and mm -hmm. one of the typing tutor type games where you play the game or you do some onerous task and then you play the game. Oh, and, right, that's, right, right. Uh, and that's, of course, something that gets the idea of chocolate covered broccoli uh, across pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Forgetting the title. Yeah, yeah. No, my son's playing something like that. Uh, well, he was like last year where he has to do uh, just straight up math problems and yeah. then you face the boss. And yeah. that's when he gets very yeah. excited. And yeah. It does seem to motivate him to, to get through the problems sure. because he's, he's young, you know, yeah. and I think as you develop and you get older, you're not uh, maybe as tolerant. Yeah. But well, when you compare that to a game like Dragon Box. Oh, I love that game. Yeah. Where <laughs> yeah, and my son loves that yeah, game. Where you have yeah. great design and, yes. and math is an abstract yes. concept. It's very difficult to get um, mm. to to marry the learning mechanic with the game mechanic. Right. And the designer refused to admit that there was learning <laughs> in Dragon Ball. Well <laughs> Did he really? Yeah. Wow, or she I don't That's know. funny. Yeah, wow. They have a um, well the I we met uh, CUNY Games Network met with uh, a team of Irish game developers and academics, they came over and they, we were one of the stops on their tour, I forget who it was organized by, but I learned one of the concepts from them they called spry learning, and spry mm -hmm. is the Gaelic term for sneaky learning, mm -hmm. uh, so the notion that they're giving students games and students do not even realize that they're learning concepts that will eventually blossom into fractions and um, spry learning. Yeah, yeah. Cool. And maybe that's it, if, if the, I don't necessarily advocate for that, but if if you don't realize that you're being taught, um, then maybe the design of the game is is really good, meaning mm -hmm. that they're mm -hmm. teaching you without you having this feeling that you're in a learning environment. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you might want explicit learning, of course, mm -hmm. but I think in that type of implicit, maybe implicit learning might be better for process knowledge. Mm -hmm. You can teach um, algebra maybe without even using equations or numbers, 
uh, because the logic might underlie what will eventually be taught later. Uh, this also goes for programming, you know, the box-based mm. programming, uh, visual scripting uh, in uh, Snap and Snap. Oh my God. What's <laughs> MIT's program? We, we should keep all doing this. We should be able to get it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll come. Uh, scratch. Oh, yeah. It's just a failing of memory. That nothing mm. more. So Scratch uh, does this, of course, by you know building those fundamental programming blocks. You spoke a little bit about this before, but um, so your students making all these games semester after semester, and after they use them in the class, what happens to these games? So do some of them commercialize? And how yeah. many games have your students actually made? Um, yeah, it's hard to, to put a number on it because I can give you the math and we'll, we'll compute that later. It's uh, maybe, uh, so 50 games before I started teaching the course, and then the course has been ra running for almost a couple of years in one form or another. So that's four semesters times 30 students. Um, so that's a lot of games. How many make it to the finish line? Well, they all do in one form or another. My new milestone, which I believe is also a milestone for undergraduate research in general, is that it should make a publication. And I have yet to make that with a student. Okay. But the idea for me would be that the game would be in a published form, either commercially via the game crafter or some digital platform that they choose, or that they collect enough data to publish it in an undergraduate research publication. And I believe that's the, you know, if you didn't write about it, it didn't happen. So mm. that for me is the ultimate goal. I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet. But uh, mm. so how many have made it out there? Um, well, you can go to transformativegames.org mm. uh, and there's a gallery of student games that were completed, albeit very much incomplete, but those are the, some of the independent study students that I had um, who made it to the finish line and presented at a conference or something oh, like that. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, they now present posters, if I didn't make that clear. Mm -hmm. So my students, they make posters, not papers, mm -hmm. um, so they can learn the skill of making a poster, which is also not taught in my department explicitly. Um, so we have an annual, annual undergraduate research conference and so far, the the deadline is just too early for us. Mm -hmm. But next year, hell or high water, uh, my students will present their game designs at, at this conference. Is that regional or your at your institution? It's at our institution, but it's very it's a pretty large conference mm -hmm. as far as undergraduate research conferences go for uh, primary undergraduate institutions. Mm -hmm. And if they present there, then they offer they have the opportunity of presenting at various summer programs or at different colleges within CUNY, or even take it to something like Posters on the Hill, the National um, Undergraduate Research Council has. Yeah, curd.org yeah. has, uh, has opportunities. So let me ask you this. Um, either in the early years when uh -huh. you were first uh, coming to this pedagogy, uh, maybe still now, oh. potentially, are there any sort of pernicious problems that um, seem to crop up or, or used to crop up mm -hmm. with regard to student learning and student engagement around this uh, business of student design and, and if yeah. so you know how did you kind of negotiate through that and you know yeah. obviously you're still sticking to this pedagogy right. so it's uh, uh, so apart from the issues that we've discussed about um, being addicted to secondary reinforcers grades and points mm -hmm. apart from that in the actual um, uh, challenges that they face in learning and designing um, I would say hmm because there's a lot of little problems. I'm trying to identify the biggest. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that there's the classic in any design program. One is scope. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's kind of naivete about how sophisticated the design needs to be. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, so regarding scope, most of us know in this field that it's really easy to try and design something that's much too large and mm -hmm. they put much, too much into the game and that that deviates what I'm trying to teach them build something small and grow it over time and not only do I teach that for individual design of a game or a psychology intervention that really speaks to how uh, scientists need to create research programs in general. You don't just suddenly okay. say, I'm create this massive research program. No, yeah. you do a single experiment and then you learn from that experiment and you grow and then you have a theory mm -hmm. 
that will now guide all your future decisions and every future design you know, both as the students do mm -hmm. and me as an educator every change I make in my course is testing this giant theory of how students mm -hmm. learn in this environment um, so so yeah so uh, scope is a problem and then the lack of sophistication is usually students um, referring to their intuition and what they know from culture, media, and easily accessible resources. Uh, and they use that mostly to design what they're trying to do rather than delving into the primary literature. Mm -hmm. And I hammer this in a lot with them. I say, it doesn't matter where you start. You can start with friends, opinions, Wikipedia, um, websites. Learn as much as you can about the field, but you need to be very specific about your knowledge and eventually get to evidence-driven uh, decision making and that is always hard in any course but I find that um, if they're not getting to that point in my class then they're truly not using evidence-based design mm -hmm. and that becomes a problem because they're not learning one of the most important messages that I'm trying to get across so yeah two so big what challenges. Do you, so what do you do in that case so so say you have a, a you know maybe three or four different groups. There's one group that just won't. Yeah. They're, they're having trouble getting there. Well, that's where the FaceTime in the classroom is very useful because um, you can both see some of the work that they submit and what they're using as their resources. But you can also see um, sort of the tropes and cliches they end up in when they design a game. You can see in their game that they're designing something that you know is probably not going to work for something that exists in the literature and it's quite obvious. Um, and b boy, it's a case by case. It really yeah. is a case by case thing. So it, and for the instructor, it really does mean getting into a dialogue with the students. And my classroom is like an architect's studio, right? Mm -hmm. There's, if I'm doing my job, I'm not actually saying much at all. The students are all really, really working on their design. And then I come by and have a little conversation with each one. 30 students means maybe I'll get five minutes which each one, which is not a lot of time. But in that moment, I'm allowed to see what's going on and inform them. So what I do that works um, to reach more students more effectively is I will also uh, group people together and do the equivalent of think, pair, share, square, but I'll have students share their designs with each other. Um, and then big up problems. Sometimes they'll throw things up on the whiteboard mm -hmm. and we will collectively critique a student's game so that everybody can benefit from maybe the mistakes that the student was making or the lack of depth that they were going into in, in some particular yes. avenue. Okay. Oh, so interesting. So what surfaced uh, just now is that the games that students are designing are individual projects. Yes. They are not collaborative projects. No. No. Okay. Have you ever tried collaborative? Uh, yeah, and there's pros and cons for both. And uh, one of my colleagues, Debbie Sturm, um, is mm -hmm. she works in a different way. She has people work mm -hmm. on teams. Small teams, I think, are usually um, the norm in this case. And it's good because it builds energy and synergy between people. Uh, the reason I do individual is because I really want, um, at least in this paper design course, I want the students to be able to tap into their motivations for being in the room. I really want them to design a game that aligns with their individual professional and career goals. And it also allows me to see who's getting it and who's not. Sometimes individuals can be buried in groups, and we know that. Mm -hmm. But of course, then there's mm -hmm. this problem. I have less time per project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if a student is, is falling by the wayside uh, and I don't intervene, then their teammates aren't there to help them, and they might slide a little further behind. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you sense. Um, so you've talked to us a lot about all the intricacies of what you, what you do in the classroom, the theories behind it, your own pedagogies behind it. Um, when you mention these ideas to your colleagues or to the college, have you ever had to strenuously defend yeah. <laughs> game-based learning or the way that you do game-based learning? Yeah, I, I could see this coming. Um, yeah, it's, it's curiously an uphill struggle. And at one time I was at the... Um, a meeting of HEVGA, the Higher Education Video Game Alliance, and we met at NYU um, to have, I think, the seminal meeting of that group. And somebody mentioned, I think it was Catherine Abister, said, just don't put the word game in your grant. Mm 
and I've discovered this, is, this speaks mm -hmm. to the things, the troubles that I'm having with the students in some cases, that game automatically trivializes the endeavor in their minds. Mm -hmm. And it is very hard to get past that. Um, and uh, the strategies that I've, you know, what, what, if we can have a long conversation, then it's not a problem. People understand. I start to tie why games are important, why games are sort of the high art of pedagogy, and how it is the most sophisticated form of interactive and active learning you could possibly have digital or non-digital, I tie that to the psychology literature, the education literature, and then the neuroscience literature. And once they get that whole story, they're like, oh, I can't believe we didn't get that. But it is easy to be dismissed. It really is. And that's a sad thing. I, um, the word gamification is also mm -hmm. something that, that, uh, that, that makes this problematic because game-based learning has been applied in the private sector and by private companies and learning rather inappropriately, and as a result, um, it's given us a bad name uh, to the point where uh, the neuroscience community penned a very large letter about brain games and how they didn't generalize to other populations. That also gave a ver very bad name to, to the field because you had a number of authorities in learning talk about how games were bad. And it was not that games are bad, it's that those games were poorly designed. They um, you know, and in fairness to the company that did that, it was a learning process on their own. They weren't trying to do this ma maliciously, but they didn't realize that they were designing games for specific tasks that wouldn't generalize. And they were trying to make claims about that uh, without the appropriate um, evidence. I think the companies have evolved to do better. Uh, and I think neuroscience has you know, acknowledged that there are good games out there. But uh, yeah, it's an uphill struggle all, all the time. Yeah. Um, Rob, this was fantastic, and thank you Thanks. for sharing uh, all these gems. Oh, thank yeah. you. Not just with us, yeah. but their audience. Yeah. And uh, it just reminds me how much we should be working together. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I think it's wonderful. I think the greatest thing that I always talk about in, in when we talk give presentations for CUNY Games is that for CUNY, almost all of this started in the, the uh, English department. And you're one of the uh, core reasons for that, Joe, and uh, Tori as well, right? You had a yes. When I was uh, working yeah. at BMCC, uh, yeah. came to partner with uh, the English department and a few others. But yeah, yeah, I think it really was born out of the BMCC English department. Yeah, yeah. Slowly, projects can snowball. You amalgamate, grab, gravitate people towards you, and find common interests, common goals, yeah. and just yeah. let you grow it more and more and collaborate. So yeah, yeah, so don't let any neuroscientist tell you that you're doing it wrong <laughs> because, you know, it's the confluence of these these disciplines that makes something unique like this uh, blossom. Mm -hmm. And it's been very exciting. I agree. Well, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you.